Hey YouTube and welcome to Strudel Tech. I'm Andrew and on today's video we're going to be upgrading the server case because hard drives. Enter the server room, a lonely place where my server lives, dusty and tired from non-stop use. I primarily use the device for network attached storage. The number one problem video editors run into is not having enough drive storage. This PC case only supports two hard drives, or four with modifications. In this situation, it's nowhere near enough. I've already resorted to using external drives, and personally, I can't stand the sight of it. This case is the Rosewell Magnetar, and it has been a great budget start. In fact, I got it for $25. Although it has been a great entry to the server world, it is no match for the Fractal Define 7XL which can support over 18 hard drives. This case is an absolute monster. This case has it all. Not only is it giant and have a beautiful glass display, it's one of the most well-designed cases I've ever used. For one, it has these wide open fin slots that allow great airflow, and the case is engineered to stay quiet. The front chassis bay can be open for access to optional optical drives or to allow more airflow. This door, as well as the panels surrounding the case, are covered in this sound deadening mesh. This was absolutely critical in my buying decision, as I am constantly around my server and want it to be as silent as possible. The case weighs about 50 pounds. The access bay can be operated with one hand and uses a partly magnetic switch. This mechanism is flawless, and once we get inside, we see we have a ton of room to work with. The comparison between these cases is not necessarily night and day. They both have support for full-size ATX motherboards, and both have well-ventilated fronts to allow for maximum airflow. And they are both PC cases. That's about it. The Rosewell Magnetar uses an old-school unscrew design to access the bay. This process feels barbaric after using the magnetic switch on the Define 7, but still allows for easy entry. This server is running headless, meaning it has no graphics card. It is an AMD build with a Ryzen 1700X at its core, a 650 watt power supply, 16 gigabytes of RAM, a 500 gigabyte solid state drive, and over 10 terabytes of storage. Let's rip it all out. We begin the case swap by removing the access panel. A lot of people will say to use anti-static bands and gloves. I wear socks and use my hands. It's easiest to start by identifying all the cables connected to the motherboard and removing them. It is important to be careful because some of these connections are fragile and can break. Most are not. You're more likely to run into stubborn cables. Cables that don't want to disconnect. Ones that'll make you rethink your life choices and decide, I don't need to remove this RAM stick. I can remove the cable without removing the RAM stick. And then ultimately giving up and removing the RAM stick. It's become personal, but with a little more persistence, we have won the battle. We have removed the cables. Now, it's time to unmount the board from the case. Most motherboards are secured with 7 to 9 screws. It's important to use a screwdriver with a magnetic tip as the screws are tiny and can assist in their removal. The amount of magnetism is not enough to damage the components. As you can see, I am extremely fast at this. There is no need to remove the heatsink from the motherboard. Now, it's time to remove the motherboard completely. Take your time with this process, as the underside of the board can be scratched, bricking the device. I don't realize it now, but I have cables tied to the rear of the case, preventing me from removing the board. Never force components, and always take the time to look around to see if there is anything additional mounting the board to the case. After examining and realizing that there are no more screws, I finally decide to flip the case over to see if there is anything it's caught on. After removing the rear panel, I see the problem. Twist ties are preventing the board's removal. I separate the twist ties, replace the panel, 
and the board is free. Now we can finish what we started. With the board unscrewed and uncut, it's time has come to leave this home for another. I cut out a piece of cardboard to set the motherboard on after it's out. Now we go after the hard drive cage. This is one of the modifications I made to this case. This cage was pulled from another computer case, mainly because it allows me to mount it to the bottom. It was closer to the intake fans and thought it was important to keep cooler temperatures. Now we remove the rest of the cabling from the drives. After removing one of the hard drives from the cage, I can start to remove the mounting plate. The mounting plate doesn't just secure the drive in place. It is also designed to absorb vibration. And since vibrations can kill hard drives, it is very important to always install these. Each plate mount has four screws and four rubber grommets to absorb shock. And next, we move on to the power supply. Some power supplies have non-removable cables. My power supply is modular, which means I can add and remove cables as needed. And again, some cables are much more frustrating to remove than others. There are four screws securing the power supply to the bottom of the case. Once gone, taking out the power supply is cake. Power supplies are sealed boxes, so you don't need to store it on cardboard or anything. Next, we remove the computer turbo booster. Some people have nicknamed this the RGB cable. Now we go after the solid state drive. Computer cases can sometimes be a labyrinth of not knowing where one cable goes or connects. It's part of the fun, I guess. When all else fails, just start undoing all of your cable ties and pushing cables through any of the case openings you see fit. Now that we have that out of the way, the hard drive mount is next. The solid state drive connects to a mount like the magnetic drive, but because there are no moving parts in a solid state drive, it does not need to absorb vibrations. After disconnecting the cable and removing the solid state drive, I decided to put the mount back in the case so I don't lose it. It's always a good practice to replace case peripherals because they will get misplaced. In finishing up the removal, we are going to clear out the remaining loose cables still in the case. Things like another power supply cable and the SATA connectors, which plug into the hard drives. And just like that, this case is empty. Now the time has come. Doctor, scalpel. We start by removing the glass panel. I never installed the IO shield on the previous build. IO stands for in, out, and helps with airflow, preventing magnetic interference, and aesthetics. Don't be like me and forget to install this. It's important. Now, it's time for everybody's favorite part. Actually swapping the components to the new case. This case comes pre-mounted with standoffs. Standoffs are what the motherboard sits on and what the screws fasten to. Some cases have you install these manually in case you are using a different size motherboard. Go slow with this process. Line up everything like your life depends on it. This is a puzzle piece that only fits one way. After the screw cutouts are lined up, we can secure the board. We start screwing. It's important to provide just enough force. There is no need to over tighten anything. Every computer case will come with its own accessories. Sometimes the screws to mount the board can be different sizes. This is true in this situation. The screws are larger, higher quality screws. Next, we start the process to install the power supply. This case is different in that it has a shroud to hide the power supply. First, the mounting plate is removed. Now we have to flip the case to gain access to underneath the shroud. The non-glass side panel uses the same magnetic clasp as the glass side panel. The giant empty bay is where the hard drives go. Fractal did a great job providing the tools needed for great cable management. You can see the cable ties and how everything looks really neat and tidy. I'll have to undo these before gaining access to the bay. The cables you're seeing here connect the power button, reset switch, front USB port, and headphone jack. Removing this plastic piece reveals the home for the power supply, as well as even more hard drive storage. I'm going to feed these cables through for easier installation. Take a look at those socks. There's the first motherboard cable, the second motherboard power cable, and a SATA power cable. Flipping the case on its side should make installation a bit easier. With the cables fed through, 
I begin to connect them to the power supply, as once it's installed, it will be harder to access. Thinking ahead and planning your build can save a lot of time. That's me plugging a cable into the power supply. And there I go, plugging in another. It's too bad I didn't think ahead to loosen the pre-installed hard drive cages so I could actually install the power supply. Eventually, the light bulb goes off. I have to remove the bottom fan filter before loosening the hard drive cages. Luckily, this process is quick because the cages are attached to sliding rails. I'll just move them out of the way and retighten them into position. Four screws per cage. High quality screws. The added room allows the power supply to be slid into place and installed. The screws are reattached to the mounting plate and one more secure check of the cables is performed. Next, it's time to mount the hard drives. This case comes with six hard drive mounts with additional ones available for purchase. Just like with the previous case, these mounts use rubber grommets and four screws. The protection against vibration is more from other hard drives in close proximity. Imagine how much vibration can be going through a case loaded with over 18 hard drives. After lining up the hard drive with the cutouts, I fasten all four screws. Here is a closer look at me screwing a drive in. Finished with the first one. These hard drive mounts are secure and designed to be removed and installed easily. Again, we install the vibration absorbing rubber grommets. There is a really satisfying catch after installing each of these. Nerd fun. Next, I position the hard drive into the cage. Then I correctly position the hard drive. That's better. By this point, we have gotten really good at screwing. There are four to install like the previous plate. There is no reason to go fast. Take your time and go slow. It's better. Once everything is attached, we replace the mount back into the slot and secure it. The mount clips to a hook underneath and then is fastened at the top. The second hard drive gets installed to the case the same way. This would be way cooler if there were more hard drives. After tightening, we move on to connecting the power cables. This SATA power cable can plug into three devices at once. I'm constantly planning out the path each wire will take in order to account for cable management. I'll use the cable fastener to make it look neater. Now the hard drive SATA cables are connected. These are what connects the drive to the motherboard. I'll put these aside till later and now connect the power cable to the fan controller. The wire doesn't have enough slack. I'll have to reseat the SATA cable so that it is closer to the power connection. And after performing a few cable modifications, we have done it. Just going to make sure these cable ties are closed up because next it's time to install the solid state drive. Unlike the other case, the mount for this is located outside instead of inside. Two screws firmly secure the drive to the mount. I forgot to connect an additional power cable to the power supply. Once done, I attach the other end to the drive along with the SATA data cable and then refasten the mount using the included screw. Next, I push all of the SATA drive cables through the case opening so they can be attached to the board. There are three cables to connect. SATA cables are easy to connect because the ports are relatively large and a built-in clasp has them lock into place. The RAM stick I previously removed will need to be reconnected. It doesn't require a lot of force to install so long as it has been positioned into the slot correctly. There are a few more cables which need to be pulled through so I can connect them to the board. This cable connects the USB port on the front of the case. And this one connects the power button as well as the reset switch. Next, we connect the fans which cool the processor heatsink. A heatsink is a metal device used to lower the processor temperature. There are two fans. This slot is perfect to hide the excess fan cable. A unique feature of the case is that it includes a fan controller and I'll need to pull the cable through and connect it to the board for it to work. Now I'll plug in the rear exhaust fan into the fan controller. The fan controller sits at the top of the case and supports nine additional fans. Now I prepare the intake fans to be connected. There are two fans. I'm choosing to connect them to the board as opposed to the fan controller out of preference. Lastly, the RGB strip has a magnetic back. I position it and connect it to the board. The final step in the case swap is cleaning up your cables. It's easy to organize this mess when Fractal has included cable mounts and ties everywhere. 
I'm positioning everything enough to make sure I can close the side panel without resistance. While some may go the extra mile to have both the inside of their case as well as the outside have immaculate cable management, I prefer to go the Simpsons route. After all, once that panel is closed, no one is going to see this. There is just one more plastic shroud to replace. Now everything can be sealed back up. The panels are very easy to reattach. They can only be aligned one way and snap into place. I'll make one final adjustment to the cables on the inside, because, you know, cable management. Then a quick replacement of the bottom air filter. It's come time to attach the glass panel. And just like that, we're done. The server looks absolutely incredible in the Fractal Define 7XL. It's so high quality. It makes the inside components feel faster in the same way adding an RGB strip turbo boosts a computer. The sheer size of this case towers in comparison to the Rosewill Magnetar, and the hard drive capacity should future-proof me for some time. But does it work? Oh yeah, it works. The power button is large and has a very satisfying click, which is more than I can say for my first peel attempt. Luckily, I get a second try. The LED strip combined with the tinted window panel gives off a really ominous glow, and the sound insulation allows for near silent operation. I can barely hear this thing. Before I move the server back, I placed a piece of cardboard underneath it. The server sits on carpet, and this can cause the power supply intake fan under the case to be choked. This simple solution fixes the problem. Now that we're back up and running, we can create more content. Like this video if you liked it, and subscribe for more future content. Thank you for watching.